Ladies and gentlemen, it is January 27, 2022. I am Matt Belinsky. This is your weekly dose of sanity, the prevailing narrative. Um, later on this episode, I'm going to be speaking with a guy named Aaron Sabarium. He's a young journalist who caught my eye a little over a year ago. He's been doing great work, but he did some exceptional work recently. And what I really liked about, uh, about what he did was this is journalism with impact. So he brought a story to light that then within about a week of his publishing it brought direct institutional corrective response, right? So it wasn't just something that got, you know, shuffled all over the internet and caused a bunch of buzz. He actually had an impact by bringing certain new information to light. Uh, and now what information was that? Essentially, the the rationing of scarce life-saving COVID therapeutics by skin color. Um, and I know that some people might hear me say this and hear us discussing it and think, no, nah, they've got to be exaggerating. There's no way that doctors, medical professionals, and public health systems are outright discriminating against people based on the color of their skin in rationing legitimately life-saving treatments, right? Or that there's got to be some other explanation. But I think as you, if you listen to the interview, you'll understand that there really wasn't. Okay, so here's what was happening. In a, a bunch of private health systems and in some public health systems, meaning, you know, mandated or, or instructed by the state's public health department coming from guidance from the FDA, COVID therapeutics, monoclonal antibodies, and some other scarce, scarce uh, treatments were being, the, the rationing of them was being determined by scoring systems, right? You get two points points for this, one point for that, seven points for this. So literally skin color would be more valuable in the scoring system than having pretty severe underlying health conditions. I mean, your skin color would be more important than what congenital heart failure or diabetes or whether you're 64 years old as opposed to 18 years old. And literally it wasn't even like the scoring system was broken down by race necessarily. It was literally white or not white. And legitimately not being white got you more points in some health systems than being diabetic. And as we all know, that that does not track to risk from COVID, right? You could think like, okay, wait a second. Is there another genetic explanation here where, you know, where people of color, minorities or non-white uh, ethnicities genetically have a more disposition to harm from COVID and thus, you know, th that scoring system made sense. And if you investigate it, it turns out that that's not true, that that it, it does not track with those factors, that everything tracks with socioeconomic status and other underlying health conditions, but not skin color alone. Yet that's how the scoring systems were were calibrated. Okay, so Aaron exposed this story and literally within a week, a number of health systems walked it back. And I think you, that shows just how ridiculous and how wrong these systems were in the first place that it would that once the story was brought to light it was so obvious that they needed to be changed and and i don't want this to come off as this is where we've got to get past right versus left or conservative versus liberal it's just it's a matter of right and wrong this was wrong okay it is morally ethically wrong for a 63 year old white person with diabetes to be denied treatment or have a tougher time getting treatment than a uh, than a non-white person who's 19 and doesn't really have any other underlying health conditions and you think i'm sorry you think i'm exaggerating that this didn't happen these things were happening and in our uh, the, we've just distorted and we've torn to shreds these other admirable and noble virtues like equality and justice and tolerance and and in our this modern quest for these principles, I, I, I think that we've really lost our way. And I, I, I don't know. Some people might want to paint this. I mean, Aaron, he's the editor for a publication called The Free Beacon. It is a more right-leading publication. And people want to make this kind of a this a, a, one side versus the other political item. But no, this is just this is about literally keeping people alive. Um, and and I, I, listen, I'm just very impressed that Aaron at Aaron's journalism here um, and what he was able to accomplish in exposing this story. So, um, you know, dig into this. Listen, if you think that that I'm exaggerating on this. Listen to the interview yourself. Make your own a, own determination, and also keep an eye for you know, and and keep keep conscious of the notion of investigative journalism. Okay, because as I discuss with Aaron, uh, in another era this would be considered, or maybe in this era it's considered investigative journalism, right? But here's the thing. This didn't take any investigation by Aaron, and he'll even admit this. He literally just had to go compile information that was publicly available. This was all in plain sight. It's something very wrong that, once again, as once some attention got paid to it, corrective action was taken. But this didn't take him 
interviewing whistleblowers at hospitals. It literally was publicly available knowledge and they just expected no one to notice. And for a long time, nobody did notice. So I think that also says a lot about the our information environment that at this point, the standard for journalism is so low, you're not even looking for someone to do investigative journalism. You're just looking for them to actually find stories of relevance and, in, and, and interest based on information that's readily available. So that interview is coming up after we go after a few topics. I know that one was a little heavy, so let's start off with something a little bit lighter. I don't know if the saga of West Elm Caleb has hit your radar, but good God, if you want to understand what's going on between the sexes and go what's going on in social media these days, this is a pretty good case study. So Vlad the Impaler, Ivan the Terrible, Vigo the Carpathian, God knows who the newest villain is. Uh, uh, pop culture villain that we have is West Elm Caleb. Um, who is West Elm Caleb? Uh, on one hand, we could consider him to just be a meme, not an actual person, but he is an actual person and was subject to one of these weird TikTok pylons that is kind of taking the internet by storm right now. And I think it's very evident of a lot of, of how the internet works, how social media works, and, and its impact on gender relations. Um, so a, a lot of this kind of falls into the rubric of cancel culture, but I think we that's that's a really tired term, right? I think what this is more so when we're publicizing, we're bringing what used to be private incidents it, that have to do with interpersonal dynamics that were handled privately and deciding to hang them up, you know, like a big fish on a hook on a picture on the internet and make them matters of public concern. So in this case, the other day on TikTok, uh, and this is apparently very prevalent on TikTok, that young women will go to TikTok to uh, uh, summarize their unfortunate dating experiences. So one young woman gets on her TikTok account. Apparently, she had a couple hundred thousand followers. Talks about being ghosted by some guy named Caleb in New York City. All of a sudden, in her comments, jump a bunch of other girls from New York who all uh, kind of... Uh, question mark, uh, West Elm Caleb. Apparently there's this, there's this guy named Caleb in New York. He's a designer for West Elm, kind of a hipstery dude, as it turns out. And he has a pattern of ghosting girls that he met on hinge. And through these, this comment box and through these social media posts, it, all these girls seem to have discovered that, you know, that they all had similar experiences with this guy, West Elm Caleb. So what are these common experiences? Okay, West Elm Caleb, he ghosted people. Um, he sent at least one person an unsolicited nude photo. Apparently, he recycled the same Spotify playlist and claimed he had made it just for each girl. Cheesy move, but how much are we going to hold that against him? Anyways, this thing became a firestorm. As of yesterday, the hashtag West Elm Caleb has over 3.4 million views on TikTok. There have literally been thousands of videos made about West Elm Caleb. And so what are these videos about, right? On the, They seem to be on the one hand, it's like this guy has become a meme. He's become kind of beyond beyond a human being. He's now a trope, a, a category unto himself with a lot of young females talking about their own West Elm Caleb and whoever, whichever guy engages in, you know, kind of traditionally catty behavior, ghosting, flaky, leading girls on and then and then ghosting them after a date or two. Sometimes it's referred to on TikTok as a love bomb. Um, but and then also just your kind of typical cancel culture stuff with a, a bunch of there being kind of a, an online hashtag campaign to ruin this guy's life literally to call up West Elm, try to have him f uh, fired. He's been kind of chased off the internet right now. He put out, I think, one public apology, but this is a real thing. There's kind of this firestorm around West Elm Caleb, and I'm sure a little bit of it is kind of tongue-in-cheek because this is kind of goofy, and you know, you're at this kind of sappy, lavender-colored uh, uh, you know, mid-range home furnishings place and his name is Caleb and you meld that together and it's, uh, our art is, life is stranger than art. Um, but this really does seem to be evident of, uh, how, what dating is for young people these days, right? Um, at every turn, your private dating life could become a matter of public concern and and your the kind of peculiarities of your dating life could be hung out in front of the entire world for everyone to view and you know did West Elm Caleb act in the most uh, uh, moral manner himself? No, but at what point are things that should remain private worthy of all of a sudden becoming publicized? We've kind of live in this social media surveillance state where everyone is considered a public figure if you try hard enough. Um, so I don't want this to come as, as another kind of missive against cancel culture because you're seeing kind of an odd 
reaction to this. Most of the, you know, kind of young pop culture websites, the feminist websites, a lot of stuff that it really makes its name off clickbaity cancel culture, outrage mobs and whatnot. They seem to be taking a different tone to this than they usually take to these types of little incidents. Buzzfeed, you've got Caleb from West Elm is bad at dating, but probably didn't deserve being pushed through the TikTok meat grinder. On Vox, stop canceling normal people who go viral. To quote Vox, what's worse, ghosting someone you met on a dating app or calling up that guy's workplace and demanding he be fired for ghosting someone on a dating app? Uh, it's good food for thought, right? It's like where, what truly is moral and ethical, right? In the cancel culture era, everyone is kind of aimed towards, okay, social, new social and moral codes need to be enforced by public shaming and the threat of cancellation and a bunch of people that you don't know finding out something bad you did on the internet, calling your employer and getting you fired. Okay, we, we took it as a bit of an article of faith that that was a, a way to aim towards, if the arc of the universe bends towards justice, that's a way to bend it a little more steeply. But now people seem to be questioning that and not just conservatives, not just free speech warriors, even the very the liberal clickbait websites that usually engage in this stuff seem to be pulling back a little bit. So you got Vox, you got BuzzFeed, Rolling Stone, and Rolling Stone has become another clickbait emporium. Um, but even then, this seems to have gone too far. The internet uproar around West Elm Caleb is out of control. One man has become persona non grata on TikTok for allegedly ghosting half the dating populace of New York, but the backlash speaks volumes about the lives of the very, quote unquote, very online. And here's the thing. West Elm Caleb, this guy, and once he's he's been identified, I believe his name is Caleb Hunter. Okay, so Caleb Hunter, this 25-year-old hipster design furniture designer for West Elm. I mean, he wasn't very online. He was not a public persona. He didn't have a big following on any social media platform. He was just a dude with a hinge account. Okay, was dating on Hinge and he did some shady stuff and he ghosted a, a, a few girls and some of them ended up finding out, you know, in tick, uh, comment boxes on TikTok posts that they all had scheduled dates with him on the same day. Um, but what about that makes him very online or otherwise a public figure? But this is dating in modern age. Like you, you trip, you know, trip enough trip wires and you become you know, subject to public censure. But it seems like that's now leaving a bad taste in some people's mouths. Jezebel, whew, very aggressive fourth wave feminist website. Even they think the campaign against West Elm Caleb has gone too far. They actually have an interesting take on it. Um, their the title of their piece, West Elm Caleb was an algorithmic trap. So their thesis seems to be, and, and this is one that may be more evident, there's an argument that a lot of people these days seem to be making against social media in general, is that these platforms are juicing their algorithms or tweaking their algorithms specifically to foment outrage, to indulge outrage, uh, simply for the sake of engagement, more eyeballs and more revenue. And and that's that's Jezebel's take on West Elm Caleb that this can all be traced back to the TikTok algorithm and they wanted a bunch of people to get it, that something a, a hashtag like West Elm Caleb gets hot and they find ways to surface that and this is how these things spread and that's what ca caused the pile on they might actually have a pretty good point there um, so I think interesting to track as these more, you know, as these enforcers, these online clickbait enforcers of of the new social codes are, and these kind of let's call it some of the foot soldiers of cancel culture, uh, seem to be wondering whether or not cancel culture has gone too far. We we can kind of relate that to you know, looking back now, maybe three four years past the golden era of the Me Too movement. I mean, what are really the standards for Me Too for the for what would be considered worthy of controversy around a personal dating life. I mean, I, I think that, you know, and, and I actually watched a couple of videos of some of these younger female TikTokers. One, I believe her name is Kate Galvin. And I, it's interesting. I mean, what, what is the perspective of the young female TikTokers actively dating in Manhattan? I mean, are they part of the vicious uh, social media pylon or, or or to the extent that they ever fit, thought that cancel culture might be justified? Why did they so? And why might they not think it's justified for this Caleb guy? And Kate Galvin, I mean, she had an interesting take here. And then she said that in one quote, gossip sometimes keeps women safe from abuse and for predators. And that certainly can be true is that when you spread quote unquote gossip, which I guess this entire West Elm Caleb incident seems to be the social media version of gossip, right? You know, the publicizing or spreading the the kind of 
you know, idiosyncrasies of people's private dating lives, right? Um, if this guy truly had engaged in harmful behavior, then yeah, you're warning other women and you're tipping them off to, to be on the lookout for this guy. I guess what the Kate Galvins of the world and now even the Jezebels and the, the BuzzFeeds and the Slates are saying is that kind of being a dick is in, in your dating life does not qualify, right? That these, these types of things are better kept private matters dealt with interpersonally, you know, maybe you tip off your girlfriends, maybe your social circle doesn't go and hang out with West Elm, Elm Caleb. They don't invite him out for a drink if they ever run into him, but uh, a kind of putting them up for public censure and public struggle session and potential, you know, employment impact and calling up West Elm to get them fired. That's not leaving such a great taste in people's mouths anymore. And, uh, and could this be a recalibration of, of the standards and and tactics of cancel culture, um, I think we're seeing a little bit of that, and and I think it's something to be aware of. And you know, once again, that could be the case. There could be a recalibration here. Maybe some people are coming to their senses. Maybe a lot of people are feeling off put about making everything public. Maybe people are just getting turned off now by these campaigns to to invade people's. Uh, uh, private lives when they haven't voluntarily made themselves a, pri- uh, a public figure. And and maybe, and I think that's a really interesting topic to explore as well, like what constitutes a public figure in this day and age when even someone someone like, you know, serial hinge dater Caleb could be considered, quote unquote, very online. So super interesting. Um, you know, I love when these kind of satirical, goofy, social media controversies and and episodes you do tell a larger story about where the culture's at and, and how people relate to each other in the modern era so uh, this one certainly qualified west elm caleb um come out of hiding bro you're you, everyone's gonna they're gonna take it easy on you nothing to fear maybe clean up your hinge profile or maybe even terminate your hinge profile probably not a good look for a month or two but if that's the worst that happens to our boy caleb i think he'll survive So big news out of the Supreme Court. Yesterday, Justice Stephen Breyer, one of the more liberal members of the court, announces his retirement. Um, Directly in response, Joe Biden announces that he's going to be replacing Breyer with an African-American woman. This is another one of those instances where a, a decision or an action taken ostensibly in the name of admirable principles like justice, equality, sympathy, fairness, inclusion, what have you. Is that really what is that a true reflection of this decision? I mean, did we not just learn our lesson in terms of choosing a, a person uh, in a position of extreme importance in our society based on gender and race alone? Did we not just learn that lesson with Kamala Harris? I mean, she's a, a, an unmitigated disaster. She's not helping the Biden administration whatsoever. I mean, she's harming the cause of civil rights, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion by her by her incompetence. She's been promoted well above her capabilities and it's on display for everyone to see. So we're going to go and just press rewind and repeat the same mistake in in appointing someone to the highest court uh, uh, position on the highest court in the land. And, and beyond that, like, does this check out when you when you look at this and say this is a decision that is just justifiably being driven by uh, uh, addressing historical imbalances and representation? Well, Clarence Thomas is on the Supreme Court. Clarence Thomas is an African-American man. He's one out of eight members. That's 12 and a half percent of the Supreme Court is African-American. That's generally that's just about what the uh, the the percentage of the popula- American population that African Americans co- um, constitute. So if you're putting another African American on the court, once again, the problem is another African American on the court. The problem is another African American on the court specifically because of their gender and race. That's 25% of the court is African American. That's about 80% uh, uh, higher than their uh, population share. Right. So this I'm sorry, but the claim that this is being done in order to address historical imbalances, that story doesn't check out a lot of people. And I want to say something that I think is is a pretty pernicious um, and nefarious way to approach this is that because Clarence Thomas is conservative and a Republican, he doesn't count. I mean, is that really how we want to handle these issues that we're going to make? incredibly, you know, really important decisions on the basis strictly confine our choices strictly to those that match a certain uh, set of demographic characteristics. But then those who also fit those demographic characteristics don't count if they hold the wrong views. I mean, this is not this is not a healthy way to operate our society. And I mean, is this what is the Biden administration doing? Is this really going to come off well electorally? 
Do they think this is not going to turn people off? Do a lot of people, and I talk to females and African Americans who feel this way, that this stuff is condescending, that this is patronizing, and that they're being treated with kid gloves in searches for positions being, you know, that people are being chosen just because of their race or their gender and not because of their qualifications. And I mean, I'm going to have a dive deeper into this next on next week's show, a little more time to let some of the dust settle here. But the, the early response, I mean, uh, this is just the Biden administration's racial essentialism, supposedly in the name of, once again, addressing historical imbalances. And it seems off. It seems miscalibrated. I think it's going to I think it's going to backfire electorally. And also, I mean, is this really creating a, a, a kinder, gentler, more just nation? I mean, are we sure that 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 this is even moving the ball ahead um, for its most basic objectives? I'm not so sure it is. Um, but the Supreme Court, uh, either way, it's still going to be about a six to three balance between conservative and liberal. But I, I don't know, man. I, I think the Biden administration and its criteria for choosing high level positions is is, is distorted and, and it's it needs to change. Something else that is making waves and is going to be making a lot more waves, the regulation and moderation of the big tech companies. Um, just if you don't know, I'm an attorney and I, I represented a lot of companies in e-commerce, digital video, the tech and startup world. Um, and obviously, companies like Apple, Google, uh, Facebook, etc. These are massive companies. I don't represent those companies, but I represent companies that do business with them. Right. So this is a topic of interest for me. So the the first couple phases of the internet, let's call it 2001 through 2020, the big companies were given, were, the government treated these companies with a lot of deference. There was not much regulation uh, in terms of, and we'll get to the categories in which regulation might filter through, but they let the comp these companies grow, compete, acquire other companies, consolidate and build their businesses and build out commercial activity on the internet without much, much pushback from the government. So that seems to be changing. And I'm actually going to give the, the Biden administration a little slack here. I'm actually in favor of some of this, right? I, I think that there does need to be a closer look at some of the, the uh, anti-competitive activity uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, speech and moderation. And I think that we do have to investigate some of the ways to maybe reduce some of the uh, near monopoly market power of some of these big tech companies. But the Biden administration is, is throwing out a ton of signals that, that it's going to do so. And there's been some pretty significant action taken recently. So I'd say there's three buckets to uh, regulation of big tech companies. One is speech and moderation and censorship. Um, that's that's one, one I'm not going to get into right now because there actually hasn't been much regulation or legislation around that one specifically. Certainly a topic of interest of mine, but you know, can tech companies exercise traditional private company rights in m moderating their content and determining who can use their services, uh, even social media companies that do reflect some characteristics of utilities and common car carriers? I mean, is the government going to intercede there in the spread of information or quote unquote misinformation? That's one category. Another category is mergers and acquisitions. As these big companies you know, swap up other companies in their sphere in related industries um, and combine and, and concentrate market power and market share across a couple different sub verticals. Um, that's something that it, historically in the U.S., there had been some pretty strict anti uh, uh, anti competitive forces within the government. But that those have not been brought to bear in the 21st century or in uh, regards to the big tech companies. I mean, if you, whether you want to talk about Facebook and its purchases of Instagram and WhatsApp, um, Google and YouTube, Amazon, you know, uh, as we'll get to in a second, they're buying up a number of content companies and, and beyond them, uh, uh, engaging in merger and acquisition activity, essentially starting their own companies and their own brands that they can then, um, that, that they are then able to accelerate through their own store. Um, and then the third category is just basic commercial activity. It's like selling products, offering services are the big tech companies in terms of privacy, um, offering of services, advertising, you know, allowing vendors to sell on their platforms is what they're doing there. Anti-competitive, um, uh, uh, monopolistic, or is it something that should be allowed? 
So let's go through those those last two prongs. One is mergers and acquisitions. Um, the Federal Trade Commission and Department of Justice just issued you know some guidelines and a plan to modernize uh, modernize merger guidelines, which means more scrutiny over mergers. There's a new chairman of the FTC. Her name's Lena Khan. She's very young. She's in her early 30s, I believe. She's been an outspoken critic of the market power of Apple, Google, Google and Amazon for quite a while. So um, you might not realize this, but there's a lot of big tech M&A in the pipeline right now waiting for government review and approval. We've got Discovery and Warner Media. We've got CAA, the agency, and their purchase of, uh, of com formerly competitive agency, ICM. You've got Amazon buying MGM, the movie studio. And then literally on the day these new guidelines were announced, uh, a huge announcement from Microsoft announcing uh, they're going to buy Activision for, I believe, $68 billion, one of the biggest uh, mergers in American commercial history. Um, so that raises a lot of interesting questions. Traditionally, you know, you're trying to judge whether or not something violates antitrust law, or whether uh, a merger is anti-competitive enough to to be rejected um, or or to find trouble in its approval, you know, based on which market you're describing, right? But it's difficult to define markets in the in the digital day and age. So you can look at Microsoft, they've got gaming hardware, they've got gaming platforms, and they're going to go ahead and buy a major developer and publisher of video games. Just because you can, if you can find video games and interactive games uh, on other platforms other than through Microsoft, does that mean now that, okay, you know, the fact that they are such a behemoth that they've taken such a large market share, I mean, are we analyzing it strictly within the market of just video game publishers? It That's questionable. And these are the types of, of uh, criteria that we need to analyze. Um, so it, it kind of ironic that, you know, that that was announced literally on the same day that the, the Biden administration hints that it's going to take a more discerning eye towards big tech and and, and uh, technology and media M&A. Then Ms. Khan has given some interviews recently. Here are some of her quotes. Um, we have to make very difficult choices about which billion dollar deals we're going to ensure we're closely investigating, but there are very real trade-offs in terms of what, of what work is going to come at the expense of what. She says, what are instances in which certain types of actions could have a market-wide impact? If we're able to obtain a particular settlement or consent decree or get a good outcome in court, what are instances in which uh, that could really change the dynamic in the entire market rather than just, you know, here or there? And I think what she's saying is if they're going to reject or oppose certain M&A activity and and uh, and deals that would otherwise concentrate market power, I mean, is that really going to move the needle? They don't want to reject a merger or an acquisition just for the hell of it. They want to reject it where it's really going to maintain an even playing field amongst the competitors in the space. What that can mean, uh, we'll have to see. But I think it's going to be difficult because you've got to rely on some precedent and recent precedent does not fall in favor. How is the FTC or the Department of Justice going to justify rejecting certain mergers of a certain size when certain pr recent previous mergers over the last you know five ten years were allowed to go through? So, so the, every every um, acquisition candidate now is going to be able to make the case. This recent merger, this merger in 2014, was allowed to go through, and it hasn't sunk this market. And there's still competitive forces in this market. So how are you now claiming that my proposed merger acquisition? Um, is anti-competitive or, or would create a monopoly. I mean, just for instance, the Trump administration tried to block AT&T at Time Warner. They tried to block that merger. It didn't work, right? The the courts rejected that. So now you go ahead and Warner Media is being spun off. Discovery is purchasing them. I mean, it's going to be pretty tough to reject a, a smaller spinoff and purchase of uh, a, of a piece of a deal that was approved or uh, that was approved by the courts just a few years ago. So it should be interesting to see um, I, I think at the very least, I, I think we can be clear that the Biden administration is going to make some attempts. There's going to be some opposition. The idea that all these uh, all these deals are just going to sail through the courts and through the political legislative process with no pushback, um, that's, that's a fantasy. So we'll have to see where they decide to push. Uh, another big piece of legislation that could have some pretty significant impact on the the way that the average consumer interacts with tech companies that that offer goods and services. It's called the American Innovation and Choice Online Act. It's got to be the most prominent antitrust bill in Congress in some time. And it's actually looks like it's going to pass. I mean, it has bipartisan support. It just passed committee in the Senate 16 to 6. Five uh, Republicans joined 11 Democrats. And so this is not some some uh, uh, there's not a 
partisan dichotomy here, right? I mean, you're, you're seeing both Democrat. There's very few things, if anything, that Democrats and Republicans can agree on these days, but they seem to be agreeing that the big tech companies need to rein themselves in and, and kind of pull back on some of their potentially anti-competitive business practices. So what does the American Innovation and Choice Online Act do? This, first off, this really targets just the biggest companies, okay? It, 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 the, the legislation has a threshold on market size and user base, and it literally just concerns Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. So this is about anti-self-preferencing. This would prohibit tech platforms from favoring their own products or services, disadvantaging rivals, or discriminating against uh, amongst other businesses that use their platforms in a manner that would be materially harmful to competition on the platform. So the best example of this would be Amazon releasing its own products and essentially giving them the, the most featured space on their pages, right? They're, them featuring their own products at the expense of the vendors and other uh, merchandisers who are trying to sell on their platform. That This may very well impede on their ability to do that. So that sounds pretty reasonable. That sounds pretty sensible. Hey, don't if these companies are going to be both the the retailer and the wholesaler, if they're going to play both sides of that trade, don't let the retail piece favor their own wholesale. You know, do engage in self dealing and self preferencing with the wholesale piece. Um, the the tech companies fought this one tooth and nail. Tons of money went towards lobbying against this bill. So what do they have to say in response? I mean, the most persuasive counter to this legislation, I would say, came from Kent Walker, chief legal officer for Google and its parent Alphabet. Um, his comment, these bills would impose one set of rules on American companies while giving a pass to foreign companies, and they would give the Federal Trade Commission and other government agencies unprecedented power over the design of consumer products. So th the second piece, I, I, I don't really buy. The first piece, however, is very interesting. They're saying that, yeah, this might be justifiable uh, if we were to only look at, uh, if we were to only analyze the domestic market, but that's not how the world works anymore. These digital platforms are uh, are unconditionally available and accessible internationally at all times to a worldwide market. So why are you hampering American companies? Because you're not going to be able to apply these these principles necessarily to foreign companies. So you're putting domestic companies at a disadvantage, and that I think is really the rub and the the fundamental difficulty of antitrust in in the uh, area of era of globalization and digital commerce right because if you're tr if the american government only has authority over domestic matters but these companies are competing in a global marketplace and so yes there is a legitimate a valid argument that if you uh, it, that it, if you limit the business activities and put these these cuffs on domestic companies, okay, foreign companies are just going to be able to operate without those restraints and eat up market share. So um, something to keep in mind. Uh, but once again, I, it's pretty clear that the Biden administration and even you know even Republicans in Congress want to start taking action against the largest tech companies. One other piece of legislation that is not as far along as the American Innovation and Choice Online Act, but could be pretty in influential as well. It's called the Open Markets Act. And this is pre essentially preventing Apple and Google from taking, requiring uh, uh, anyone who wants to sell an app on their within their app stores from them to take a 30% cut of all developer revenue. So uh, they, the Apple and Google do have near monopolies over their their own app stores, right? And, and the concentration of market power there is just astonishing. And hey, if you want to be able to access uh, um, all Android phones or all iPhones, you have to play by Apple or Google's rules, and that requires cutting off, breaking off thirty percent of every one of your sales to Apple or Google. And some companies have tried to challenge this. Um, you know, a couple game companies tried to end around on iPhone and and kind of allow for in app purchases that that kind of skirted that were uh, outside the clutches of of the thirty percent commission. Um, none of that's worked so far, but it looks like Congress is is no longer you know is, is not taking such a favorable eye towards that any longer. And so the Open Markets Act would require companies that control operating systems to allow third-party apps and app stores and would prevent those companies from blocking developers from telling users about lower prices for their software on other app stores and would essentially disrupt the, would prevent them from essentially from this universal edict that all purchases through their app stores without fail must include the 30% commission and if you don't like if you're a, an app publisher uh, if you are a a 
merchandise company, if you're anyone selling anything, if you don't like that 30%, then sorry, you don't get to be in the app store. Um, so this is stuff that is going to, this is stuff that's going to have a direct impact on your life, right? Anyone who uses digital platforms and products, um, there's a lot of stuff that we've gotten used to, both, but both for good and for bad. And this is something that younger consumers are going to have to get used to because they're not used to big dis big regulatory disruptions in their life or commercial activity. I mean, uh, other generations can look back on AT&T being broken up, for instance, and all of a sudden you had a number of regional telecom companies where before you just had one national company, things of that nature. And so it might come as quite a shock to a lot of people, but uh, I think some of this needs to be looked at and could be justified. So uh, big tech regulation, it's coming only question is the scope and whether or not, you know, it, while it may look sensible from a domestic perspective, are we really kneecapping some of our, our best domestic companies in the market for innovation while they're competing with foreign markets? Should be a fascinating one to monitor. So something that popped back up on the news and social media this week that's been popping up quite a bit is critical race theory and the battle over critical race theory in schools. So just real quick, this is not going to be the deep dive on critical race theory and this topic in terms of whether it belongs in school, whether it exists in school. I'm going to touch on that a little bit, but this is really about institutional decay and what is either informing or driving that or how that's being reflected. Okay, I'll get this will all connect in just a second too. So critical race theory, just first off, and there's been a big hubbub over one, what it is, and two, whether it's actually being taught in schools. You've got all these bills out there that are ostensibly banning critical race theory in elementary school curriculums and high school curriculums, um, but you've got a lot of people claiming that it's not being taught in the first place. So let's just touch on that for a second. So what is critical race theory? Um, Encyclopedia Britannica refers to it as an intellectual and social movement and loosely organized framework of legal analysis based on the premise that race is not a natural, biologically grounded feature of physically distinct subgroups or human beings, but a socially constructed and thus culturally invented category that is used to oppress and exploit people of color. It's a fairly elaborate and, and kind of complicated construct. Um, so is that what critical race theory is entirely? Um, not necessarily, because it's not just one specific theory. It's more of a body of scholarship as it's described elsewhere. And I think it's inseparable and CRT is inseparable from the notion of intersectionality um, and intersectionality. It, it, the, the underlying thesis is that all group differences and outcome are the results of oppression and that oh, that all human interaction action can be segmented or, or kind of defined by power dynamics where, you know, based in every interaction, based on your demographic characteristics, race, gender, sexual orientation, you are either the oppressor or the oppressed. So that has kind of infiltrated critical race theory, whether or not it was part of its uh, original makeup. Um, so is that being taught in elementary schools expressly? Um, probably not, but are a number of aspects of critical race theory being taught? I mean, I think if you look closely, I think it's undeniable that the answer is yes. And even beyond that, I mean, there's more than enough evidence out there that a lot of educators and and people involved in the public education system are, are not just admitting, but I mean, they're, they're proudly championing the fact that critical race theory is being taught in schools. For instance, uh, Dr. Nikolai Vitti, the Detroit superintendent of schools, uh, this earlier this year even said, our curriculum is deeply using critical race theory, especially in social studies, but you'll find it in English language, arts, and other disciplines as well. I, that's not that's not a one-off, folks, okay? There's a ton of educators out there and even school programs and curriculums that are uh, on their face claiming to teach critical race theory. So the uh, idea that it's just not taught in elementary schools, that one is false. You can argue over to the extent to which and whether it's accurate to say that critical race theory is being taught when, certain, when only certain aspects of it are being taught, but the whole idea that this is an illusion, that is false. There, there is critical race theory in elementary school curriculums these days. Okay, so what's going on with that? There are a number of bills in state legislatures being passed to, you know, the headline is ban critical race theory, but then what are the sub points and headings and bullet points of like, what does that actually mean? And I think that this is a very good example of how a lot of these things are being mischaracterized and misrepresented. Um, what was on, what was going wild on social 
social media last week was around the Florida legislature and their recent bill on this topic. Um, the Associated Press put out a tweet, a Florida bill that would prohibit public schools and private businesses from making white people feel, quote unquote, discomfort when they teach students or train employees about discrimination in the nation's past receives its first approval Tuesday. So you read that tweet, you read that headline, you think, well, that's ridiculous. You can't, you know, prevent anyone from uh, feeling discomfort. And if you teach about America's warts and wrongdoings, well, you know, some people might feel discomfort and boo hoo. I mean, they, they, we need to teach the truth. So then if you actually look under the hood and look at the legislation, does it actually do that? Because a ton of people went and and posted the story on social media with some kind of flippant remark about, oh, Florida doesn't want to teach American history, pitiful snowflakes, blah, 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 whatever. OK, well, well what does the bill actually say? So Zaid Jelani, who's one of the best on these topics, an incredibly moderate, centrist, middle of the road, you know, kind of sober thinking individual who, who takes on these issues. I mean, his meta commentary here was this description by the AP is pretty bad. SB 148 doesn't mention white people. It mentions race and it doesn't say it's illegal for someone to feel discomfort before an ex instructor who espouses, promotes, advances, inculcates that feeling, which is consistent and that this is consistent with civil rights law. So let's look at the actual language in the legislation in the bill to see what it prohibits. It prohibits things such as the following, that teaching that an individual by virtue of his or her race, color, sex, or national origin bears responsibility for or should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment because of actions committed in the past by other members of the same race, color, sex, or national origin. An individual, by virtue of his or her race, color, sex, or national origin, should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment to achieve diversity, equity, or inclusion. Also prohibits that an individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or other form of psychological distress on account of his or her race, color, sex, or national origin. Okay, does any of that sound like trying to prohibit white people from feeling discomfort over the teaching of history? I I'm struggling to find an honest reading of that i mean it seems like a pretty dis or or anything in there that would prevent the actual factual teaching of racial discrimination slavery jim crow housing just discrimination or other forms of past historical discrimination that are, are just un inarguable like uh, that would take a quite absurd and i'd say disingenuous reading and interpretation of the statute i mean i think it's a pretty clear distinction between Teaching slavery, good. Teaching slavery, allowable. Teaching elementary school children that they, because of the color of their skin, bear some responsibility for past slavery and Jim Crow, not okay. Maybe some of you guys think that it's okay to be teaching children in modern age that they, due to the, their, their group inclusion and due to the color of their skin, bear some modern day tangible responsibility for the crimes of the past. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not on board with that. And I imagine a lot of you other people, a lot of the other people out there aren't either. However, the claims that, you know, this just wants to uh, negate or disappear the teaching of slavery um, or or pr uh, racism in schools, I mean, that, that's just ridiculous. And I think any honest reading of the actual bill shows that. But uh, that, of course, you see what happens, right? The AP prints a completely disingenuous framing of the legislation and often it goes running and now everybody thinks that Florida is trying to ban the teaching of slavery in school or trying to ban uh, uh, the um, you know, ban emotions for white people. Once again, this bill does not even mention white or any other specific race. It applies the legislation equally across all races, ethnicities and national origins. Aside from that, the bill was initially uh, written and instituted by a Hispanic lawmaker. But these things all just get completely lost in the shuffle. OK, so that was that's the critical race theory piece. Then a adjunct and adjacent to a lot of the critical race theory bills that are out there right now are what's being called um, uh, curriculum transparency bills. So you're saying, hey, listen, if you're not comfortable banning certain uh, let's say critical race theory. Let's say someone says, yeah, we're teaching critical race theory. And you know something? Sorry, that's an, a, a, a valid school of thought and should be taught in schools. And, you know, if you if you don't like that no idea, then counter it with other ideas in the curriculum. And you're saying, all right, we shouldn't be passing bills that ban any teachings in, in school, period, other than, you know, the most other than something that might start bleeding or, or drifting into what would be already be illegal. OK, fair enough. So then there are a number of bills being passed around curriculum transparency. 
And that is not necessarily banning or prohibiting anything, but simply requiring that school districts post, you know, post their materials online and give parents full and unfettered access to the materials that they're in the, the materials that they're using to teach the curriculum, teach their kids and any programs that might be informing those. Right. For instance, uh, a lot of New York schools are now using the 1619 project as the basis to teach American history, despite the fact that just a whole host of factual claims in the 1619 program have been debunked. Uh, once again, not not a matter of opinion, just factually incorrect. But let's say, OK, at least you parents should get to know, uh, uh, have full transparency into their curriculums. Um, it seems like some people even seem to have a problem with that. Um, NBC post a tweet conservative activists want schools to post lesson plans online but free speech advocates warn such such policies could lead to more censorship in k-12 through schools let's behold this for a second they're they're claiming that more transparency giving acts parents access to the materials that are being taught to their kids uh could lead to more censorship does this seem like a, a rational thought? Does this seem like that's a, an honest portrayal of what free speech actually is, right? Because the whole idea of free speech is that it's it, it, that there are ideas that are contributed to a, a free marketplace of ideas. But public school curriculums aren't that, okay? Public school curriculums are not debate. They're literally state-sanctioned and state-programmed teachings, right? So the state... The state is determining, hey, we are going. This is the program that we are going to teach, and this is in a one-way, right? It's not a two-way discourse. In a one-way dispersal of those ideas, we're going to spread these ideas to your kids. So the, the the whole idea of a free speech marketplace that this is stifling, simply false. But just beyond the the inherent contradiction of transparency and free speech being at odds. No, transparency is in the name of free speech. Um, so that's NBC. But then you start to see, you're thinking, wait, who who is against transparency? It's so odd. Um, some groups and institutions that you might not expect, one being the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. OK, ACLU tweeting out. Curriculum transparency bills are just thinly veiled attempts at chilling teachers and students from learning and talking about race and gender in schools. The ACLU against transparency. That's fascinating. OK, that seems to be against their their kind of um, organizing principles in the first place, but also is very much in contradiction to their very recent past. Zaid Jelani, you know, once again, someone I think that you should be following and who does great work. And he had put out a recent post in regards to this topic titled the ACLU suddenly reverses its support for transparency. So recent in, in the ACLU's recent history, um, the ACLU of Nevada argued vigorously for transparency when the state schools were setting their sex education curriculum and policies. To quote the ACLU, the days of backdoor decision making are over. Compliance with the open meetings law is meant to secure the opportunity of parents, students and community members to have a meaningful impact on the development of policy. We are all well served when decisions on the appointment of sex education advisory committee members is subject to public scrutiny rather than the result of the presentation of a narrow range of interest. That is Stacy Pratt, legal director of the ACLU of Nevada. OK, um, ACLU in Connecticut used records to uncover curriculum in all of Conne uh, uh, Connecticut, I apologize, Kentucky, in all of uh, Kentucky's 173 school districts. So uh, I don't think anyone would be surprised when you hear that the American Civil Liberties Union is in favor of uh, uh, parental transparency and, a school, and school districts not being able to hide what they're teaching kids. Yet all of a sudden, when there's a pushback on at least what some many parents, and not just right wing parents, a lot of centrist parents believe to be toxic ideas around gender or race, all of a sudden transparency is no longer a good thing. All of a sudden, transparency is actually a, a tool of censorship instead of a tool of free speech and, and a free marketplace of ideas, right? That's that's kind of strange, right? Um, and let's just be honest here for a second. The ACLU, something that whose principles and integrity was hard, if you could disagree with them on the substance, but you knew that they were very consistent in their principles, that they were always going to defend free speech, due process, and transparency, that's been out the window recently, right? They've become some sort of progressive advocacy group. And it, that that tr due process, free speech, and transparency are in, in equal rights and civil liberties now take a backseat to whatever the kind of progressive milieu or or the progressive cause of the day is. I mean, and this is bad. 
This is bad when a trusted organization no longer can be trusted. And this is happening to the ACLU kind of across the board. Some other places where they seem to be walking back, uh, uh, they seem to be kind of contradicting their their kind of historical principles. So Glenn Greenwald on the ACLU in a New York Times op-ed this week, and this was in September, New York Times op-ed this week, the ACLU completely reversed its views, arguing vaccine mandates actually help civil liberties and bo- bo- and that bodily autonomy is not absolute. Okay, so all of a sudden, the ACLU for decades, you know, uh, universally in favor of bodily autonomy against mandates. It would seem that civil liberties and mandates just it's uh, everything. The the argument over mandates is a balance between the benefits of mandates versus civil liberties. Right. The ACLU has tossed that out the window. No longer defending civil liberties. They're in favor of mandates and they believe uh, help civil liberties. So. Glenn Greenwald uh, wrote a piece on that in the New York Times. They've even acknowledged this, that the, that the ACLU seems to be at odds with its prior, you know, its prior internal mandate of defending free speech. This is from June of last year. Once a bastion of free speech, the ACLU faces an identity crisis. An organization in that, that has defended the First Amendment rights of Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan is, spit, is split by an internal debate over whether supporting progressive causes is more important. OK, so this is no secret. Literally, they said Support, supporting progressive causes is now so important that we're abandoning our principles. Free speech, due process, transparency, civil liberties, and, you know, as protection against mandates all out the window. We are now a progressive advocacy organization. This is not good. OK, forget once again, toss conservative or liberal out the window. It was a good thing that you knew the ACLU would always be there to defend civil liberties. You knew the it was good that the ACLU would defend free speech no matter what, whether it was the Ku Klux Klan or some liberal, you know, back in the day, a Lenny Bruce or an other liberal comedian that was running afoul of censors. It's good to have neutral organizations. Having organizations and institutions that are always caping for one side or the other is bad, right? So regardless of where you are on critical race theory, I think it's very troubling that you no longer have New, you no longer have neutral civil liberties organizations, or at least that the one that was more prominent, that was most firmly entrenched in the belief in civil liberties and free speech, no longer believes in that and no longer stands for that. Um, so once again, we will get deeper into the C- the CRT thing isn't going anywhere. OK, these transparency cur- curriculum transparency bills are wide ranging. There's being battles fought that you've got parents screaming at each other, screaming at school board members at school board meetings. And there's really and the, the Virginia election recently was to a certain extent decided just on that on this topic. Right. So this topic is not going anywhere. We will dive much deeper into the substance of CRT in this battle. But for a moment, I want everyone to kind of, kind of reflect on on how you know this really is more so revealing further decay in once we're neutral and valuable in their neutrality institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the prevailing narrative. I am Matt Belinsky, and I'm here today with Aaron Sabarium. Uh, he is a, a journal, young journalist who caught my eye uh, a little over a year ago, um, and you know, even more importantly, he recently indulged in the lost art of what I guess you can call investigative journalism. And even more thrilling, his journalism seems to have triggered a direct uh, institutional corrective action from the topic that he was investigating. Um, he was most recently; he's currently an editor at the Free Beacon. Uh, he was recently. Um, uh, at Yale, uh, the uh, opinion editor of the Yale Daily News has bylines in the American Journal and other various publications. Um, Aaron, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Matt. So the topic uh, on which you conducted this investigative journalism um, was on the apparent rationing of life-saving medical services and therapeutics based on race in a number of coming through a, a variety of state public health organizations and also um, multi-state hospital systems. Um, this is one of those topics where at first glance, someone takes a look and says, there, there's no way this could actually be happening. And there's no way that, you know, the medical community could be essentially directly violating its Hippocratic oath in denying you know, in in essentially prioritizing race over health attributes and risk factors in the allocation of scarce life saving therapeutics, and then you actually take a look and know that's actually exactly what's happening. Um, so I'd love it if you could kind of give us, you know, a foundation uh, and an explanation of, of the issue. What your, you know, what your what your findings are, and also kind of how this story caught your eye and what initially catalyzed you to follow uh, to follow it down the path of investigation. Well, so what caught my eye was um, 
there was a, a well, I guess formerly New York based journalist. Now she lives in Florida, but um, her name's Carol Markowitz, and she tweeted about the New York policy. She stuck that up. Independently, I saw on a law professor's blog who I follow, he'd written something about what Minnesota was doing. And then I did some digging of my own and found that Utah, of all states, um, yeah. had its own kind of COVID risk calculator that incorporated race into it to decide who would get priority for monoclonal antibodies. Um but then what really caught my eye in reading through these documents is that several of them mentioned guidance from the Food and Drug Administration. Mm -hmm. um, the Food and Drug Administration, when it issued its emergency use authorizations for uh, the various monoclonal antibodies, as well as the uh, antivirals from Merck and Pfizer recently, in each of those EUAs, they list a bunch of risk factors like diabetes, obesity, et cetera. That's, that's their definition of high risk, and that's who it's approved for, high risk people. Then they add uh, other medical factors, like, for example, race and ethnicity, which is the only sort of sociological factor they list. They don't, they don't actually say class or poverty or neighborhood or anything else. Mm -hmm. Race and ethnicity are the only ones that single out. You know, you know it's, it's almost like a parenthetical, but the, these triage plans explicitly cited that and said, by saying this in its EUA, the FDA is saying that race itself is a risk factor, and thus we are justified in making race alone, not just things that are correlated with race, uh, a criterion for the allocation of medical care. Um, and so it's a very good example of how a, a kind of, you know, really a, just a parenthetical aside probably deliberately snuck into a a uh, federal guidance document by activists can then kind of populate throughout the the medical system in this decentralized way uh, and form the basis for pretty radical and it should be noted facially unconstitutional uh, triage policies. And so just to give, if listeners aren't familiar, I mean, in Utah, you get two points for being non-white, but only one point. And so just for real, quick, real quick, I just want to interject to make sure everyone understands that the the medical, the uh, these these hospitals and medical systems have scoring rubrics and yes. the scoring rubrics determine where certain scarce therapeutics like monoclonal antibodies go. And Aaron is explaining to you right. some of the, the yes. rating criteria for those systems. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm like really deep into this. So I forget for sure. to explain for the basics, sure. but, but yes. So, so, so basically the way it works is you have to score above a, Well, in some places you have to score above a certain threshold to be eligible. In other places, the way it works is that just basically, they basically just will serve the people with the highest scores first and then kind of go down the list mm -hmm. and just, you know, deny care once they just no longer have any more of it. Um, but so so in Utah, for example, their risk calculator gives you two points for being not white, any non-white ethnicity. You know, it doesn't matter. Uh, and it only gives you one point for hypertension or I think it's hypertension um, or congestive heart failure mm -hmm. and all sorts of other things. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, con congenital heart failure. Yeah. Yeah. Literally of, being being of Hispanic ethnicity counts for more yes. than having congenital heart failure. And in Minnesota, in Minnesota, um, the way their scoring system works, a healthy 18 year old Asian woman with no underlying conditions, which is quite possibly like the lowest risk demographic, like mm -hmm. lower than a 18 year old white male. Um you know, we're talking like zero percent chance of death, basically. Mm -hmm. um, that person would get higher priority than a 64 year old white male with hypertension. And, and that's uh, because the age cutoff is is all or nothing is, at 65. Yeah, yeah right. So exactly. The, the exactly. only basis for for age criteria is are you sick? Are you a 65 or above or below 65? There's no gradient of stratification for yep. scoring based on, hey, you might be 59 years old as opposed to 19 years old. It's literally if you're 64, you get no points for age. Yep. Yep. So. 
the system was the Minnesota system was particularly ridiculous. And mm-hmm. after it was publicized and harshly criticized, they removed race entirely from their rubric. Um, and, I, and I want to get to I that. And I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I do want to get to the your reporting and then the impact of that and then some of the retractions in a minute. But I want to kind of just really dig into, yeah, you know, yeah. into the perniciousness of this system in the first place. Um, and so, as you mentioned, one, the, these these distinctions, it's not distinguishing even amongst various races. It's literally white or not. Right. So it's not even distinguishing between perhaps African-American or Hispanic and Asian. Correct. And it, they're not it, it, there. There are di- apparent uh, distinctions and, and differences in, you know, health result from covid for yeah. these groups, yet they don't really distinguish them other than white versus not white. Yeah, that's correct. Um, mm-hmm. If if it were done, if they gave extra points just to black people and maybe to Hispanic people too. I think that would still be invidious and Mm -hmm. unscientific in all sorts of ways, but it would at least be a little more in keeping with the data because it is true that African-Americans are in uh, by many metrics at higher risk of uh, severe COVID. in that, I mean, there, there is no evidence at all that that all non-white groups are at higher risk than all mm-hmm. white people. I mean, that's just, there's just absolutely no basis for claiming that. And yet that mm-hmm. is the operating principle of all of these schemes. Yeah. And these are once again, this is not the, the this is quantifiable and demonstrative, right? It's not something that is a suggestion that doctors that that medical professionals within these organizations or within these states, you know, have an option. I mean, literally, this is a scoring system yeah. and medical decisions are made based on these single, you know, the these individual mm. univariate uh, 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 univariate data points as opposed to multivariate. And that and it's tallied up to determine who gets potential life-saving treatment. I just want people to truly understand that that is what is going on here. Now, the counter argument you will hear, and I think it's a terrible counter argument, but you will hear it nonetheless Mm -hmm. is, well, okay, come on. But you don't really think that a doctor is going to actually do this, right? Where the counter argument basically becomes, well, yeah, the guidance is absurd, but like, I mean, they're not mm-hmm. technically they're not really going to punish doctors for not he- adhering to it. So it's really more just guidance. And we'll just rely on doctors to sort of act reasonably in the, you know, when the guidance is maybe giving a, a ridiculous result. Mm-hmm. Of course, that kind of defeats the point of the being guidance. Yeah. Then you're, why have this <laughs> right, system, like, exactly, right? Exactly. But also, you know, there's another dynamic, too, here, which is even if doctors are responsible The way it sometimes works in Utah, for example, is there will be an online risk calculator that they direct Mm -hmm. people with COVID to take to find Mm -hmm. out if you qualify. Um, And so if you don't meet the cutoff on that calculator, the state will tell you you don't qualify. Now, you might still be able to go to a doctor and say, hey, um, I'm feeling really sick and I'm worried about this. Do you have a spare dose? And maybe the doctor will give it to you, but you won't have, you know, the printout from the website saying you're eligible. And frankly, you know, I, people don't realize like, you know, average person often just doesn't know, uh, you know, that they can advocate for themselves. If a website says you're not eligible, they're just going to be like, oh, I'm not eligible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if then that person doesn't go and kind of seek care and and become their own medical advocate, uh, they really may end up not getting potentially life-saving treatment that, again, like, you know, 64-year-old with hypertension is still, I mean, they're not as likely to die as like a 90-year-old with hypertension. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a difference. But, you know, 60-year-old hypertension yeah, I mean, they they probably should be being directed to care before an 18 year old Asian, black or Hispanic kid with no health problems. Yeah. But in many cases, the 18 year old kid will, in fact, be prioritized for care. 
And once again, this yeah. is not something we're imagining, guys. I know, and so many, and we can get to how the fact checkers are trying to treat some of the claims, oh, quote boy. unquote, fact checkers around this issue. This is lit, and this is not being denied either. The, the hospital systems and the public health departments—they're not denying. Some of them have have changed the policy, but they didn't deny that this was once the policy or the guidance in the first place. OK, we're, we're not. This is not something yeah. we're theorizing on. This is actually the the functional policy by the, the health scoring systems. Yeah. And one more more example that I think is is worth driving home. It's not just governments. It's also the private hospital systems of their own volition. Mm. Um, so SSM Health which I think operates in a, some Midwestern and Southern states. And it's a big yeah, about 23 system. states. Uh, yeah, yeah about 20, and 23 also hospitals. N- notably a Catholic healthcare system. Yes. Yes. They give um, on their scoring system. They give more point. They give seven points to race. And on Jesus their scoring Christ. system, that is more than hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and asthma combined. All of that stuff combined gets you six points. Being not white gets you seven. Oof. Yeah. I it's mean, and you have to score like 20 points to be eligible. So almost half of those 20 points you can get just by being non-white. Um, and of course, now they're backing away from it. Um, but... It's out. And but, you know, they didn't even deny that they did this. They just said, oh, we're no longer doing it. But yeah, they, they literally said that they did it. They acknowledged yeah. that. No, this is not something that's <laughs> disputed. They're not they're not denying that this is the system that at least at one point was in yeah. place. And I mean, you start trying to, you know, you scroll your mind for what would be the the justification here. And then you've got the New York Public Health uh, Department of Public Health, which is n- not just not denying that this is what they're doing, but is sta- standing by it. They're not walking the, this policy back or changing the policy. And they uh, offer the explanation that ethnicity should be considered a risk factor, quote unquote, as uh, um uh, as longstanding systemic health and social inequities have contributed to an increased risk of severe illness and death from COVID-19 for these ethnicities mm-hmm. and at first glance you think okay well, well it, it is there truth there they do certain you know uh hispanic and african-american cohorts do seem in some respects to be dying at higher rates um than white cohorts although that's not necessarily universally true um so is there some underlying genetic disposition right but mm-hmm. no there's not there ha- they're not even making the argument that there's a genetic in- a disposition that is simply a person of this ethnicity inherently um by their genetic code may be at higher risk right that's not what the argument is simply yeah. that the system there have been quote unquote systemic inequities thus this is a way to even right. out and rectify those systemic inequities. <laughs> yeah. And it seems like this this Kafka-esque um, circular reasoning where nothing actually has to be proven or put to logical scrutiny because you can think, okay, clearly if a person is of lower socioeconomic status, they had worse diet they were it's more difficult for them to eat healthy they might be living in uh they might be living in heavy industrial uh areas or in ghettos and be exposed to more uh atmospheric or environment or environmental contaminants and in that case you think okay wait a second you know the that should be taken into consideration here but that's not the consideration right they will just they will draw the line simply along ethnicity and race, discounting environment, socioeconomic status or location. Right. So theoretically, you know, I grew up in a fairly well to do part of Los Angeles. But you want to know something else? It was an incredibly diverse part. Well, to do part of Los Angeles that the other people living in uh, West Hollywood, Beverly Hills, Brentwood and its surrounding areas um uh, uh, supposedly uh, the claim that any of these people necessarily uh, inherently had more exposure to environmental contaminants is fairly ridiculous on its face yet you know they do not make those distinctions correct um they don't take poverty into account they don't take neighborhood into account Mm -hmm. all of these things by the way i mean there have been examples of for example, vaccine prioritization schemes that did do this, where they mm-hmm. took basically your your zip code into account, which I think is 
I mean, people complained and I think it may have created some inefficiencies. So, so it's not, it's not an open shut case mm-hmm. by any means, but it's not crazy. Um, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's certainly less toxic and just facially insane than doing it by race. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is that, well, some of the risk calculators do take sex into account because men are more likely than women to get mm-hmm. uh, severe COVID. You know, the Minnesota scheme did not. Um, the New York scheme did not. And I mean, I think we all kind of know why, because, it, you know, yeah, if this were about risk, they would take sex into account since men die of COVID a lot more than women, mm-hmm. which is for biological reasons, almost certainly. It could be some social component, but it's probably has to do with chromosomes and how they mm-hmm. affect the immune system. Um, but of course, you know, Minnesota and New York don't take that into account. And why is that? I mean, we know why, because punching it's up, men. Punching down. I mean, yep. yeah, we know why. Like, and, yeah. and so, so you'll see too with this, I, I mean, I, I'm sure there are people who just genuinely, people who maybe haven't thought about it much will think, well, minorities have higher risks. So sure. Why not? But I think, I think really what's going on here is there's this kind of woke, uh, morality at play where just you have to do everything possible to help people of certain races and not others um and then they don't want to say that explicitly so they kind of come up with um these technocratic rationalizations that are supposedly yep. based on risk uh but they but don't survive that, scru- yeah they yeah, don't they, survive we all know that it's, right we all know that it's not really just about that um and, and this seems to sorry to interrupt you, but the, I just but this seems to have infiltrated a lot of sectors of society, in particular education, and, and another area that a mm-hmm. lot of people are starting to wake up is in terms of th- its infiltration into childhood education. But I, it feels like people never suspected that the, that the, it, you're really crossing a Rubicon in it entering into the medical field and the allocation of life-saving treatment, like life or death, where you're not, where the ironing out supposedly the, the kind of vague, holistic attempt to account for historic systemic inequities that may or may not survive multivariate analysis literally can end up with the death of an elderly person who clearly was at hot, far higher risk than another person who was able to gain access to certain treatment. And, and it really feels like this is just a a something that society, our society did for a long time have guardrails about and mm-hmm. kind of disturbing and troubling that those guardrails are no longer there. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing I would say is that this these technocratic arguments about risk and just saying, well, statistically, this group is at higher risk of X, Y, or Z. Well, I mean, flip that around to talking about policing and crime. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to like where that reasoning takes you because statistically speaking, and sometimes these people will say, well, even if you control for comorbidities and and socioeconomics, we still see some slight increase, black people more likely to have COVID. Well, okay. Well, guess what? When you control for all that stuff, Mm -hmm. You also find that black people are much more likely to commit crimes. I mean, they're not likely to, but disproportionately commit a higher share of the crime, even when you control for all sorts of things. That's just true. And what we're saying is that either you have to choose a a a, a, a single variant, single variant uh, way way of uh, analyzing things or multivariate. Either you have to control for outside factors, which would. May, there's some very yeah. legitimate counter arguments about the uh, mitigating factors of why the crime rate among certain uh, yeah. ethnicity groups is higher. So great. If you do want to do a multivariate analysis, OK, we can have that conversation. But you can't do a univariate analysis in one realm and then a multivariate right. analysis in the other. But but I also I also though think it, it's it's it goes deeper than that, because so let's say I mean, people can debate the statistics, but I think what they broadly show and what you know let's just stipulate that one group commits more crime so what Mm -hmm. if someone proposes well we know that that group commits more crime so why don't we factor race into our algorithm that determines where police go or hell 
Mm -hmm. Why don't we factor Mm -hmm. it into our algorithm for, you know, housing prices? Because I mean, hey, like, you know, some groups commit more crime. Well, I mean, doing that is it's illegal. (laughs) Like you can't do that with housing prices like that. That that breaks the law. Uh, You Mm -hmm. can take crime rates and the things into account, but you can't just use race as a variable. Mm -hmm. Um, So the. And I think that's good because we don't when you when you start allowing algorithms to explicitly take race into account Mm -hmm. and affect Mm -hmm. people's lives based on that, you are opening up a very, very slippery slope, Mm -hmm. a whole lot of dystopian things that I think we have rightly said as a society we don't want to go down. But see, we, but we they're used going to, down it with medicine. Exactly. We'll see. Here's yeah. the thing. We we said that for a while. Right. And that even if it, it was not always perfectly implemented, MLK colorblindness was positioned as the goal. Right. If you're determining ethics in any system for so long, we said we should be trying to make everything as colorblind as possible. Yeah. Then. 2010s come around race essentialism intersectionality and the great awakening come around and you say well no you know because that didn't work out perfectly even though we're, we're going to deny all the progress that it made and now we are going to be, we we are going to be fine with racial gerrymandering and race it as a deliberate conscious factor in the analysis of a number of societal institutions and while at first glance, you might be able to make some rational argument for it in some realms, what we're seeing now and this the, this issue that you've uncovered mm-hmm. is where that is an is inevitably where that leads. If you don't have as a baseline a goal of a colorblind society, if you start taking race into account in all these realms, eventually you get to, hey, which gra- which person's grandmother, grandfather, aunt or uncle yeah. do you get to save? Uh, whose life do you get to save? It's inevitable. And that's a message I'm trying to hammer home to a lot of people who seem to want to indulge a lot of this intersectionality based thinking it was like you guys you've got to see where this plays out logically and i think that's what you know you really did with your reporting here and to get back to that for a second um then you, we've discussed some of the specifics of how this is implemented then to just so i'm correct and so the audience understands this this traces back to the fda yeah and now look i mean the fda didn't tell states to racially discriminate Mm -hmm. All they said was race is a risk factor. But once you say race is a risk factor and moreover, once you say race, but, you know, you you leave open that other things could be risk factors. But that's the only kind of sociological one that you list. You know, Mm -hmm. they don't list poverty class. It it it, I think creates a a permission structure. And you can see that it created a permission Mm -hmm. structure because these states literally said The FDA has told us this is okay. Um, They interpret the FDA guidance to to license explicit racial discrimination. And again, you know, yeah, like the FDA didn't actually say that. And I think that's not a good interpretation of exactly what they said. But still, Mm -hmm. I, I mean, even if they know it'd be used this way, they, they clearly had a the reason door. for, yeah. And they had a reason for, for saying it. I mean, they didn't need to include the parenthetical where they say certain conditions like race or ethnicity can also put you at higher risk. I mean, they could have said it, they could have listed other things or mm-hmm. they could have said other conditions, but not put the race or ethnicity thing. They, they did it in a very particular way. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they had some inkling of, what might happen once again it's about guardrails right is that yeah. okay and, and we'll get to how those guardrails are now reestablished. um i couldn't locate the tweet but someone once someone mentioned in regards to this issue is that there used to be kind of ethical and societal and cultural guardrails to doing this type of thing that nobody would do it because hey this is just not right we, we don't want the criticism the blowback this will have societal repercussions for us if we engage in racial discrimination in medical care right um and it's called du jour right so in in the actual policy racially discriminating yes. um but those guardrails are no longer there so now what are the guardrails okay well the guardrails seem to be um good reporting 
you went ahead and your your original story um, from the first, I believe it was from January 7th, was Food and Drug Administration guidance drives racial rationing of COVID drugs. A week later, there seems to be some corrective action taken. Um, hospital system backs off race-based treatment policy, and this was after a legal threat, which we'll get to a second in a second. And then Minnesota backtracks on racial rationing of COVID drugs. So, okay, um, there seemed to be some legal groups that were going to take legal action. And then also the additional uh, visibility provided or driven by your reporting. And okay, then these hospital systems and public health departments step off that position. What, how did you, from where you were standing as the reporter doing this story, how did you see these systems respond to your reporting and those other legal threats? Yeah, I, th I think often the way it works is that if you ask people for comment, they think, ah, uh, we don't know if this story will really go anywhere. Probably mm -hmm. safer to just, you know, not reply. Yep. Don't give him anything. Then my story got picked up by Fox News, including Tucker Carlson um, and, some, and Laura Ingram. Um, and that then kind of opened the floodgates. Uh, Stephen Miller's group announced they'd already actually announced that they were going to be suing New York. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, then Stephen Miller's group is like, oh, well, we might add, you know, Minnesota and Utah to the list. Uh, and they've already come out with a the, the, the lawsuit's been filed against the New York Health Department already. Um, and so once there's all that media attention and once lawsuits start getting filed, suddenly these bureaucracies uh get cold feet, I think, and yeah. start to backtrack. Um, but, you know, the loss, the legal threat won't really be there unless there's outrage about it, mm -hmm. um, or at least not to the same degree. Uh, so my, my yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I, you know, I don't mean this to sound self aggrandizing, but I think, yes, this is a case in which just journalism actually made a pretty big difference. And uh, mm -hmm. the lesson here is both that you need there to be a kind of dedicated legal infrastructure that will, you know, go after stuff like this. Um, mm -hmm. be, you know, there are conservative lawyers who are doing that, which is good, um, but we probably need more of them. Uh, but you also need this, the kind of media PR apparatus that brings the stuff to the lawyer's attention and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, creates kind of a chilling effect for these groups, frankly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, and lawyers, are, law lawyers are motivated by public sentiment and how much momentum yes. an issue might have yeah. and, and things of that nature. And hey, you, you do not hesitate to be a little self-aggrandizing here. It's why I brought you on. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, because we want to try to highlight when actual, it, since there's so little of this journalism being done by those who we've traditionally thought of as journalists, where's where's tangible, effective reporting being done elsewhere? And this is one of those examples. Um, and then interesting in, in terms of where the media is at on issues like this. And this was even in response to someone um, uh, uh, mentioning, you know, uh, or complimenting you on your work here. Um to quote you, people often congratulate me for my hard work, which puzzles me because it's not all that hard. The facially unconstitutional policies in Minnesota and Utah were both on the state's websites. You really don't have to dig. It's all out in the open for anyone who cares to look. And like, that's why I mentioned that you would, you know, I, I was even unsure if you had done investigate, uh, investigative reporting because you didn't really have to investigate. All you had to yeah. do was go read people's websites. And I think it's people don't quite still understand What's going on that a lot of stuff that want with a little bit of focus and attention are shown to be completely insane, immoral and contrary to any notion of, of a healthy operating society. I mean, they're, they're right there in front of everyone. I mean, you did you didn't have to work too hard to figure this stuff out, did you? No, no, no. It, it didn't take much work. And I mean, I've done things that required more digging, but this wasn't one of them. Um, mm -hmm. And uh <laughs> What I think is important to see is that it's it's the fact that it's public tells you something, right? Yes. The the, the fact that they don't feel the need to hide it, yeah. um, they feel the need to back off of it once people start saying this is race mm -hmm. discrimination, we're going to sue your asses. Mm -hmm. But they don't really. But just just at the level of kind of moral intuition, 
there has already been a consolidation of an elite consensus around racial preferences, not just in higher education, but in basically everything. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the kind of woke, anti-racist, Ibram Kendi X uh, ethos, this isn't just, you know, a kind of nascent burgeoning movement within corporate America or public health mm-hmm. bureaucracies, it is the mainstream. It yes. just is taken for granted. Um, and the only way to deinstitutionalize this is, I think, with effectively the threat of coercive legal action and mm-hmm. really bad PR or people showing up to these school board meetings and getting kind of rowdy. Because yes. if you just let the system go without interruption, this is the system. It's yes. not just seeping in. It is the system now. Yep. Yeah. This this is not fringe. This is now the this is the Wesley Yang terms of the su- successor ideology. Um, I, I've phrased that as an operating system. This is now yes. the operating system. This is now the code written for institutions. And in the absence of any countervailing force, it will creep into and take over every institution. And I think that's a reality that a lot of people uh, really wanted to to be blind to for a while, but are right. now waking up to. And it's what you're seeing with some of the pushback. Another way to, to put it for as uh, in the in the terminology of the way it's handled in a lot of private conversations. Um, a lot of people assume the pendulum always swings back. The pendulum only swings back if you push it. Yeah. It does yeah. not swing back naturally. I mean, to, to- Right. To go with the operating system metaphor, I mean, you know, you could say that wokeism is now the matrix and Mm -hmm. the the goal of journalism is to slowly uh, good journalism is to slowly red pill people, literally, Mm -hmm. you know, get them to take the red pill and get out of the realize, whoa, this is the matrix. Yeah. And then. and then you have to and then, you know, you have to to engage in in legal warfare against the quote unquote agents of the system. Uh, sorry, mm-hmm. I, I I really love that movie. So I, I can't. Resist no the no problem. You know, yeah. I some, for some reason never became a Matrix person. There's something about its its kind of frontal aesthetic that I just never gravitated towards, despite, you know, being a Keanu fanboy. But um, hey, I, I know I'm in a minority there. So all anyone who likes a good Matrix metaphor, please marinate in that one for me. <laughs> minute or two um on a somewhat related note and i i think this in terms okay you're you're the matrix fanboy. i am the analyze everything having to do with world war ii and its surrounding eras guy i uh, mm-hmm. have a strange uh un uh, inexplicable obsession and every time i turn on the tv and think i'm te- teeing up some new movie i've never seen before somehow land on a world war ii documentary or uh, uh something of that nature so the first piece that you wrote that caught my eye was for american purpose and it was called the weimar uh Weimarization of the American Republic. This was October 2020, um, right before. So it was a, a turning point in American society right before the Biden Trump election. So we didn't know who the winner was going to be. And there was in in kind of political and cultural discourse, there had been repeated uh, allusions to as America going through its Weimar phase, th- that pre Nazi era in Germany that was kind of the the preamble and the breeding ground for a more you know authoritarian takeover and and downfall of a nation um, that seemed to share a lot of similarities in terms of um, heavy, you know, uh, division, um, certain political violence, although I think it's been exaggerated. uh, The American version of that has been exaggerated and other cultural cleavages that turned out to be irreparable without a true collapse. Um, And you gave, you know, a fascinating explanation and breakdown of why you did not see uh, uh, America, uh, America in the late 2010s is entirely analogous to Germany in the 1920s. Um, So maybe if you give us a little hint of kind of your macro perspective there. And then also, has it changed over the past 15 months um, as we've seen the ouster of Trump, you know, the early Biden era, and then uh, some of these cleavages and distinctions about vaccination and, and other stuff that you've seen? How, you know, if you were to do round two on that piece, what does round two of that story look like? Well, you know, the basic argument of that piece was that there's plenty of differences between the U.S. and Weimar. And so a lot of the 
comparisons, I thought, had been irresponsible. But, you know, it was called the Weimarization of the American Republic because I thought there was one or two imp- very important similarities. Mm-hmm. And that was basically that, you know, in Weimar, people like to think uh, of the evil Nazis who took over. No, it was that both sides, the left and the right, hated the Republic in their own ways. There really was no kind of widespread agreement that this was a good political project. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a very sick, sick society. Uh, yeah. And it kind of collapsed because of that. Um, And what I saw in October 2020 was this kind of cycle of mutual radicalization where, you know, the left would accuse Trump of being a fascist. And then he'd say, well, I'm not going to accept the results of the election, you know, whatever. It's like, oh, well, okay. I mean, you know, you're not exactly refuting their their talking point there. But then, Mm -hmm. of course, you know, the right would say, well, and, you know, you guys like want to destroy our country and hate everything we stand for. And then we just come from the summer of 2020 where, you know, monuments of all sorts, including to Abraham Lincoln, were being torn down by people declaring the entire nation white supremacist and throwing Molotov cocktails at police stations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my prediction in that essay was this is going to get worse. Even if Biden wins, you know, he may be less kind of toxic as a person than Trump. But these these animosities run really deep and the mutual radicalization is going to keep happening. Um, And, you know, I I did point to some flawed, but still, I think, suggestive survey evidence in that piece that, you know, larger numbers of young Americans just don't see the founding fathers as heroes anymore. And also pretty large numbers of people on both sides of the political spectrum, at least if you phrase the question right, will endorse some form of political violence, which I think is pretty alarming. Um, So as of October 2020, I was like, yeah, you know, we might start to see some more Weimar-esque stuff in the future. Mm Yeah, this this isn't great. Uh, November 3rd happens. Then January 6th happens. I would say that all of that broadly was consistent with my thesis, although I focused in the piece a little more on the left, because at that point, it just was a fact that nearly all the political, what I would regard as sort of political or politically tinged violence in the country that year was mm-hmm. was left wing most because of George Floyd. Um, you know, I, I, I think if it had been written after January 6th, obviously, that would have being in the essay and just it's an sure. important thing to acknowledge. Um, but in terms of the overall picture, you know, look, January 6th actually kind of proved, I think, a certain point of that essay, which is not just that, you know, things will keep getting more violent, but that or, or maybe not more violent, but, but but just more fucking insane, but also that uh, both sides kind of exploit the other's insanity, because you saw after January 6th, there was all this rhetoric, which had been, I think, kind of implicit and and fulminating during the Trump years, but never quite burst out into the mainstream to the extent it did after January 6th uh, of, you know, Republicans are like a domestic terrorist faction and we need to have a war on domestic terror. You know, Biden has declared that he wants to do that. Um, And of course, you know, who's a domestic terrorist? Does it mean, yep. you know, the key, I mean, okay. So like maybe the guys who stormed the Capitol, I, I, I still don't think that's quite the right label, but sure. You know, they're, they're bad guys. Some of them maybe did have ties to some creepy groups, but like, you know, it, it, there's gotta be a lot of people who just will say, well, you know, anyone who has X, Y, or Z perfectly reasonable center, right. Opinion is a domestic terrorist. And, mm-hmm. and that's, uh, I Particularly with Joe Biden's recent rhetoric around voting rights yeah. and really, yeah. I mean, mission creep being a a kind way to put it of what constitutes, you know, um, uh, 
voter suppression and things of that nature and that things that should fall well within the range of good faith argument about how to ensure election and balance election integrity and voter verification with access to voting are now being painted as fascist voter suppression and, and illegal. And it's just beyond what what I mean, even a lot of Democrats are coming out and saying, Joe, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, we are getting to the point where just essentially any dissent from the Democratic Party agenda is labeled as neo-Confederate white supremacy by a not insignificant portion of both the Democratic Party, including its leader, and the uh, what Wesley Yang calls the vertically integrated messaging apparatus, um, <laughs> the media. Wes so, has got a great way of describing this stuff. Yeah, he's great. Uh, but yeah, no. So, so I would say honestly, on balance, um, I think the the Weimar essay has held up pretty well, which doesn't give me any comfort, um, mm -hmm. but it has. Uh, you know, uh, the other thing I would say too, and th this is something I I made a point of in that essay is. A big difference between the United States and Weimar Germany is that we really have no kind of authentic blood and soil nationalist tradition of mm -hmm. the sort that Europe and in particular Germany had. It's not to say we don't have strains of that. It's not to say we don't have strains of illiberalism or racism. Of course not. But but the very particular kind of nationalist, just outright authoritarianism that that Germany had had for a while, you know, we don't have in, in anything sure. like that way. But we do have this very strong kind of Protestant Puritan um, streak, which is probably the closest I mean, we have to to an authoritarian tradition. I mean, the Puritans were pretty authoritarian in a lot of ways. True, um, but not as outwardly uh, militaristic right no, i mean yeah, they're not everyone forgets yeah. like part of you know and one of the many places where people yeah. misremember uh the H hitler's found you know the nazi philosophies and whatnot i mean he he didn't think anyone who wasn't blonde he didn't just think german you know blonde hair blue yeah. eyed uh master race he thought the russians in particular were a separate and inferior race that the teutonic people needed to go conquer and essentially exterminate to create additional living space okay that was an active palpable yeah, yeah. narrative as part of his philosophy i'm finding it unlikely there's any particular strain no. of that philosophy an, I, an analog to that that would pop up in the yeah, american i don't see that but yeah. what i right exactly but what i do see is kind of this this um secularized woke uh version of neo uh, of, of puritanism basically i mean this is a common argument that um you know, the wasps, right, who, who dominated Harvard, Yale, Princeton, that they didn't necessarily I mean that the wasps gave up their power, but these institutions still function essentially as um, Puritan training grounds. They're just training a kind of woke secular clergy. Um, and so because I think that wokeism has more cultural and institutional antecedents in the United States than does uh, whatever you want to call, I, not to say Trumpism doesn't draw on any American traditions, but, you know, the really kind of ugly, radical, you know, racist stuff on the right. I, yeah, it's not to say there's no American tradition of that, but it's just not, I think, as quite as deeply rooted. It's certainly not institutionally rooted. Mm -hmm. um, in anywhere near the same way as um, contemporary progressivism. So if you have a dynamic where there's mutual radicalizations, mutual radicalization, the extremes just push the other extremes to be more extreme uh, and a kind of hollowing out of America's liberal center, if I had to bet on what kind of authoritarian or totalitarian movement would come out on top at the end of that spiral, I would bet on the more left wing one. Um, and, you know, I, I 
that can be a hard argument to make because I do think Republicans have done some pretty ridiculous things with the voting mm-hmm. stuff and, and the election trutherism. So that's all, you know, I'm not trying to minimize any of that. But, you know, there just is not like a massive set of media organizations and NGOs and even corporations who are all lining up behind anything that looks like fascism. I mean, they're not. They're lining up behind wokeism. So I I tend to think that's the one that will win. Yeah, it's just so... And this is something that needs to crystallize us for a lot of different people at a lot of different times. It's that nobody seems to acknowledge that the the gravity of pa- the the center of gravity for power is so lopsided at this point. Look at any vocal, visible institution, whether it be corporate, academic, nonprofit, intellectual, what ha- or media, and the, it's all on one side of the ledger at this point, right? And which causes is it supporting? Which principles is it, is it supporting? And then to try and go and, and for instance, a lot of people don't, and a point that you made earlier, one of the reasons that Hitler was able to uh, uh, democratically ri- initially rise to power, he had a lot of support from a lot of wealthy people, pretty much all of the industrialists in Germany, because you know who the other option right. was? The communists. OK, yeah. <laughs> a lot of wealthy capitalists supported Hitler because the uh, the alternative to him was the communists coming and executing them and stealing their money and replicating some uh, permutation of the USSR in Germany. OK, you don't have that allied with any kind of right wing or allegedly fascistic uh, segment in, in America right now. I mean, all the corporate power and financial power is on one side of the ledger for the most part. Um, but that's, I think, a fascinating framework to analyze. You know, if you're informed, because God knows how many people decide to shoot their mouth off about World War II, the Nazis, and, and get, indulge in these comparisons that are completely have no foundational knowledge on the topic whatsoever, but will be an increasingly relevant framework to continue to analyze some of these issues on. Um, so, Aaron, um, wanted to thank you so much for joining us. Um, Getting the the long form and the expository on great journalism and these issues that can t- that seem to pop up that are kind of mind blowing that don't really reach the consciousness uh, until someone like you does the work. Um, I think it's really fascinating and, and really appreciate um, the work that you've done and us joining uh, and joining us tonight. Um, and so we will, you know, we've seen some reaction, institutional reaction to your work thus far. New York Public Health Department is dug in its heels, but I guess it's something that we'll continue to monitor and uh, and a topic that I'm sure you'll be on top of to the extent that it does continue to pop up. So I wanted to thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I am Matt Belinsky. Once again, you can listen and subscribe to The Prevailing Narrative on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening right now. Make sure to follow me on my socials at Matt Belinsky, M-A-T-T-B-I-L-I-N-S-K-Y. The Prevailing Narrative is a Cavalry Audio production in association with iHeartRadio. Produced by Brandon Morgan, executive produced by Dana Brunetti and Keegan Rosenberger. For Cavalry Audio, I'm Matt Belinsky.